join us here every Saturday at 7 p.m. Eastern for Minhaj Fit and Ziwaj, taught by Ustad Hanif Bashir, right here on Sooner Follows. Yes, thanks, uh, Imam. Yes, we're gonna um, we're gonna delve into that a little bit, inshallah. The issue about the akama. It's gonna be a, a couple classes, though. I want to really um, mention some of the different opinions and certain aspects of it. So we're gonna be studying that for the fiqh aspect of the class. Ibnillahi Taala. So, okay, going going back to. The issue of Tawheed, the oneness of Allah in worship and the oneness of Allah in lordship. Now, last class, we said that knowing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he is the one that God, he is the one that created us. He's the one that provided for us. He's the one that has set everything in motion. The reason why we're alive today, the reason why the sun gives us light, all of these things, the plan of this world, all these things was done by Allah's wisdom. Knowing that, knowing that necessitates that we worship him. Knowing that necessitates that we worship him. Those two things go together. Because if you understand that Allah created us alone, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he planned this world alone. And he put everything into motion, into motion alone. Then it would only make sense that we worship him alone. Now what we're going to talk about today is the fact that knowing that Allah that God created us and he's our Lord and master. Knowing that alone does not make a person upon Tawheed. This does not make a person an individual who singles out Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in worship. So even though it one necessitates the other, it is not always the case. So because an individual knows that Allah exists and knows that Allah created him, well, he understands that and he understands that no one else is able to do this other than the Lord of the world. He understands this. He or she understands this. But that does not mean that they will take the next step and worship Allah alone. We understand that if that was the case, then there will be no issues with the Prophet Muhammad and the people of his time. Because the people of his time, the pagan Arabs, they understood this fundamental fact. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he is the creator, he's the benefactor that has given us and blessed us with all that we have. They understood that. And that is the reason why the Sheikh, he brings the he brings the say he brings the uh, statement of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. Well, in saltahum, man khalaqahum, la yakoonun Allah fa anna yufakum. If you were to ask them, the pagan Arabs, who created them, they would say Allah. So they understand this. Yet they were considered Muslim. Why? Because that understanding did not bring them to worshiping Allah alone. They worship Allah, but they did not worship him alone. They did not worship God alone. They did not, did not understand what that entails of worship. So this is the point that the, the Sheikh is trying to uh, make us understand that just because we understand that Allah alone is the creator does not necessarily mean that him alone we worship. Insha'Allah, 
Ta'ala. And that's all we're going to cover here for this aspect is the fact that someone who worships Allah, it shows and indicates that they understand that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone created them, created everything. He's the Lord and master of all that that is, right? They understand that. But in their worship, do they also understand that he is the only one who deserves to be worshipped alone? And remember, when we talk about worship, we're not just talking about prayer. Anything that God commands us to do and that he tells us to stay away from, doing that should be only for him alone. And because of him alone, that is an act of worship. That is an action of either a compliance in whichever way it is, whether it's compliance by staying away or compliance by uh, avoiding, these things are, or that action itself is an act of worship. So with that understanding, inshallah ta'ala, I hope that that is clear. And the floor for any questions, but I don't think there will be any questions in regards to that. It's pretty straightforward. But let's give you guys some time in the lahi ta'ala. And this is, you know, this this fact too as well, just just to, you know, like kind of a side rail here and see see if we have any uh have any um questions, is an issue that a lot of people in the Muslim Ummah, in the Muslim community have a problem with. They think because of that an individual is Muslim that they are not, or they can't fall into associating partners with Allah in worship. And you can if you don't understand what worship is. If you believe that worship is only prayer alone, then all the other things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands us to do like, for example, what are things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I'm going to ask you guys, what are things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands us to do that an individual can associate other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in it? Other than prayer. What, let me ask you, let me repeat the uh, question again. What are some of the things outside of prayer that are acts of worship that if a Muslim was, was to do it for other than Allah, they would nullify their tawheed? Paying zakat to um like okay so what is it, what do you mean by paying zakat? Paying zakat is an act of worship, right? So if you're paying zakat for other than Allah, is that is that what you're saying? That will go back to intentions. Or in a scenario, somebody else says that they that they um, are a messenger, and that you know, instead of paying the zakat that you normally would, they have new revelation that has come to them that you know the zakat is so much, you know, it's, it's this X amount, and you should pay to them instead in a specific time, specific amount, specific place. Yes, if if you listen to that and you do that, then yes, that you're committing shirk and stuff like that too as well. Uh, or it could just be that, you know, you pay the zakat, the Islamic zakat, the way that it should be paid, but your intentions for paying it is not solely to please, to please your Lord 
then that will, of course, be shirk, associating partners with Allah in worship. Because one of the things that have to be met, the criteria that have to be met for any action to be accepted is that it has to be akhlas wa aswab. It has to be sincerity for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. Which goes back to intention. And then it has to be aswab. It has to be upon the sunnah. Upon the, you know, it's a funny thing that I remember a, a, a brother and I, we were actually um, arguing about the issue of fasting, right? Because I, I think I told him that, I, you know, I, it, was, it was a long time ago. Let me, <laughs> let me clarify that. It was a long time ago. I was, I was uh, just starting to study. I was in Egypt. And, you know, I just tell a brother, you know, when, you know I, I, I fast whenever I feel the mood to fast. You know, so, you know, if I wake up one day and I'm like, you know, inshallah, I feel like fasting. I fast. And he was like looking at me like I was crazy. Like, <laughs> like what do you mean by you fast? I, 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 I fast whenever I, you know, I get the, uh, the courage or the, the notion to fast, I fast. So you say that, you know, that I shouldn't do that because that's not, you know, what you should do is try to fast the the way that the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam fast so monday thursday or what he recommended which is the odd days i mean i'm sorry not the odd days but every other day right this was what the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam would do and of course there was you know the sit to uh, the sit uh the sit tat which is the six days of shawal and you know so forth okay <clears throat> Okay, somebody says, I mean, he says, practicing the five pillars. So if you practice the five pillars, other than, uh, other than Allah, I mean, once again, that goes back to intentions. But for example, uh, a way of associating partners with Allah is by swearing by other than Allah. Swearing by other than Allah. We're only supposed to swear by Allah. And we have some uh, some Shiites that they would swear by Hassan and Hussein or Ali, from what I hear. I mean, I don't, you know, it's been a while since I studied uh, their their creed, but I do believe that some of them do do that. Think it's okay to swear by Ali or Hassan or Hussein. So. When you when you think about the swearing, what is why do we swear by something? We have to break. I think we really have to understand what it is. Sometimes when we do an action, we're not fully aware of what it means, what it represents. And I think that if we were to sit and think about it clearly, would have some understanding of why things are the way that they are. Okay. So when we swear, a swearing is validation. And it's, it's, it's validation, and it's more than that. Swearing is giving something important, a level of importance to as well. You know, it's validation and giving a level of importance to the thing that you're swearing by. You're using that name that you swear by as a testimony to your oath, to your pledge that you're making after that. It's binding. You're binding yourself to what you're saying after that by swearing by that name that you swear by. And this is the reason why something like swearing is only done using or by Allah. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Man kana halifan billah. If you're going to swear, then swear by Allah. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that. Why? Because swearing by Allah is, is, is a form of ta'deem. It's a form of reverence to the thing that you're swearing for and giving reverence is only for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this type of scenario. Okay, so with that, then we'll, we'll stop 
uh, with that, inshallah ta'ala, and we'll move on to the next uh, section of the class, which is about the 40 hadith, and we're on hadith 34. And it's the hadith of Sa'id al-Khudri radiallahu anhu, anahu qaw sami'tu rasulullahi sallallahu alayhi wa sallama yaqut, man ra'a minkum munkaran fa yaghayyahu biyadihi, fa'in lam yastati' fa bi lisanihi, fa'in lam yastati' fa bi qalbihi, wa thalika ad'afu al-Iman. Rawahu Muslim. Abu Sa'id al-Khudri radiallahu anhu in the 34th hadith of the 40 hadith of Imam Anawi, he said that he heard a Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa say, if one of you sees something that is wrong, if one of you sees something that is wrong, then let him try and change it with his hands. If he's not able to do that, then change it with his tongue. If he's not able to do that, then hate it in his heart, and that is the weakest of faith. So what we understand, okay, so let's try and um, change some of the words a little bit so we get an understanding. So when we say change it with his hand, meaning change by force. Apply force in order to change that wrong. And that type of change is for somebody who has authority, right? If you have authority, you can change things by force, make someone comply to that which is right and that which is correct. So that is, goes to anybody who's in charge. Mother, when it comes to her, her children. Husband, when it comes to his family. Imam, when it comes to his community. And so forth. Another thing that we understand too is the issue about changing with the tongue meaning using words or writing, which is in the same level as using words, writing about it. So you see something that is wrong, you can write about it, you can talk about it. But it's important to know that if the person that is doing the wrong is a person of authority, the best way but the Prophet said, uh, to uh, um, change that is to first advise them in private. You advise them in private first. That is what the Prophet advised us to do when it comes to an individual with, in authority. And it only makes sense. It is from wisdom that an individual tries to do it that way, right? Um, so writing something on Facebook, you know, putting somebody out there, having them be barren to the words that you're using and things like that, the shame, the humiliation, is that a way to bring about good? Because one of the principles of Islam is to get the good and repel the bad. And if you can't get the good, without repelling a bad, which is even worse, then you can't do it. Right? So um, keep that in mind. So the next thing is hating it in your heart, and that is the weakest of faith. Faith. So what we understand from this, too, is that faith is something that increases and decreases. And one of the things that increases it or decreases it is someone's condition or situation. And it's also something that could be limited to certain um, instances, I guess you could say. So in this instance, an individual's faith could be weak. But in another scenario, his faith could be strong. In this situation, He's not able to implement the highest form of faith, but he's only able to implement the, the uh, form which is a little lower than that and so forth. So this is, a, this is proof that shows that faith increases and decreases. 
It increases with obedience and it decreases with disobedience. Okay, so are there any questions on that? I think that is also straightforward. Give you guys a little a little time, inshallah. See if there's any questions. There are any questions. Okay, it looks like there's no, there aren't any questions, so um, let's move on. Inshallah ta'ala. All right, so the next thing we're going to cover is Sirah, or the biography of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu wa sallam who are they? The last class we spoke about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam traveling to or making the uh, mi migration to Medina and that the first thing that he did was build a masjid in Quba and then built his masjid Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam the prophetic masjid or what's known now as Masjid al-Haram al-Nabawi, or Masjid al-Nabawi. Does anyone remember what was the benefit that we got from that? What did we understand from the Prophet ﷺ doing that? Does anyone remember the benefit that we took away from that action of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu wa sallam hu alayhi? Okay, I know that the uh, the connection is kind of slow, so maybe there's some delay. That's why I'm giving you guys uh, time to answer, but I don't believe that anyone is typing an answer. So let's let's answer it. So um, we got from that the importance of the masjid in the community, and that the first thing that an individual should do, or a group of individuals sh should do when they settle in a place is to make sure that they build a masjid, make sure that they build a place of worship. That's one of the first things that should be done for the community. Inshallah ta'ala. Okay. So now we're going to talk about what the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said or the next the next um two lines. Which says, which the Sheikh says, "Thumma bana min hawlihi masakina, thumma ata min ba'du fi hadi sana." Aqalu min nisl, aqal min nisl ladina safaru ila bilad al Habashi hina hajaru. Okay, so after the Prophet Sallam settled in Medina, news of his migration from Mecca to Medina reach the Muslims. Who can tell me where some of the Muslims were at this time? Where were some of the Muslims? When they got the news that the Prophet ﷺ had migrated to Medina, where were they?
Negus. Negus, isn't that the name of the uh, the king? They were, I guess they were, yeah, they were with him. I was hoping for a place though, but yeah, they were in Habasha or what's known as Ethiopia. Right? So that's where they were. They were in Ethiopia. Um, so when they heard this news, some of them left Ethiopia and went to Medina. And here, the Sheikh, he said that it was less than half of the, the people that migrated to Ethiopia, less than half of them left and went to Medina. Al Medina and Nabawiya. So it's important to know too that once the Prophet before we talk about before we talk about those that uh that left Habasha, that left Ethiopia to go and be with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in Medina, that the, that the, the Sheikh here, he mentions that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, after building his masjid, he built a place or a dwelling place for himself, right? Um, and his scholars, they mentioned that the, 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 uh, the dwelling place that he built first was for Soda, Umul Mu'minin Soda, uh, anha. And then he built after that, not at the same time, but after some time after that, he built a second dwelling place for Aisha. Uh, anha, because he married her after marrying Soda. Now there's there's certain things, there's there's some things that we can extrapolate from the actions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Uh, when it comes to living with one's spouse or a wife, and that you should have a place for your family to dwell at. They have to have a place to live, right? You have to provide a place for them to live. Whether it is built, well, back then, it's easy to build. I mean, there, there are no, um, not too much, and no one is going to stop you from uh, building, but uh, but according to, uh, we know that the Prophet had to buy the land that the masjid is on, right? And, and, uh, and the uh, Muslims provided him with the money for that, right? But um, <clears throat> there are other places where, you know, at, during that time where you could just go somewhere and, you know, pitch a tent and you're good. As long as it's nobody's land. Um. So providing a place for your family is important. It is also important to know that the, uh, how do you say, the quality of living during that time is not like the quality of living in our time. The, the room, and it's considered a room, the room of the, the wives of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was no bigger than half off the, the praying area here for um, in this masjid, right? So half of it, long ways, you have the uh, bedroom, and then you have a little space before you get to the, uh, the, the front door, right? So as far as what that space was used for, I'm not sure, but it's, um, some of the scholars say that the uh, the length of the entire house was somewhere, I think it was, um, let me see, uh, they said 10 uh, arm length long. So 10 arm length long. It's not, like I said, it's from here to there pretty much. Maybe not even that big. I think it might be smaller than this. Um, and that used to be the uh, the dwelling place for the wives of the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa so, in our time, right, that's not, that's considered small. But we have to understand that, you know, um, 
that during their time that was probably really big. You know, we have a we've evolved to require more things and probably more things that we actually need. Space that we actually need. We talk about need and not want, need. But the female of the species are more inclined to a scenario where their living space has to be something that is comfortable for them, right? And they're gonna want the best that they can get for themselves. And that's nothing, nothing wrong with that. What you as a man now have to decide when choosing a wife is, can you afford? Hold on, uh, the man here has a question. Did this man leave in the first group and went to Medina? Yes, I do believe that he did. And uh, some of the some of the, the companions also left and went back to Mecca, like uh, Abdullah bin Mas'ud. Uh, he did that, radiallahu um, anhu. Going back to uh, having a place that's suitable for your spouse, you must first have an understanding between you and your uh, and your partner, your wife, right? Because some women, their goals are different in life. Some women. Even though all women, for the most part, like to be comfortable where they're at. For the cause they spend most majority of their time in house. So that the house is 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 their abode. It's is something that is their is their castle. So they want it to be as comfortable as possible for themselves. Having a talk with your wife or an understanding with the person that you're going to marry, that you know, look. This is what I am. This is what I'm about to do. This is where I'm going to be. Because if you plan on living in a place where the living standards are a little bit lower, that might be a problem for her. That's why it's also good for a man, not good for women, but good for a man that when he marries, he marries down. What I mean by marrying down, marrying someone who is not used to a, a social standard or economic, I'm sorry, not social, but economic standard that you are. Right. So that way, when she comes into your social environment, it is a, it is a step up from what she's used to. So she will be grateful because what would happen the other way around, because some women, they're not able to help themselves in this regard. If they feel that they're not getting something that's equivocal to what they're used to or better, you will feel it. They'll make you know by their attitude, their speech, and all of that stuff. Um, and you can say, well, what about the fearful law and stuff like that? We have to put that you know, to the side and stuff like that in, in certain issues, instances when it comes to uh, uh, the, these scenarios because Allah must done only. Okay, so, but this this is this, uh, advice for our brothers, Sisters, sisters, do not marry someone who you know that they are lower than you. And what I mean lower than you economically because you're going to only oppress them in the long run and yourself. That's the only thing that's going to happen. Unless you're not that type of woman. You've never been that type of woman. You don't care about certain things when it comes to um, lifestyle then that's okay. All right, so I think we covered everything, inshallah ta'ala, uh, dealing with that. So the Prophet Sallallahu he built two places, uh, not one after another, one for um, Umul Mu'minin, I mean, Ummahat, um, one of the Ummahat al-Mu'minin, um, Soda, and then the other for for Aisha, but not at the same, not one after the other. First, he built for Soda because he was married to her, provided her with a place to live. And this place was connected to the masjid. It's important to know that the house uh, or the dwelling place of rooms, you could call it, of the prophet's wives were connected to the masjid. 
and later on became part of the masjid. Now it's part of the masjid. It's no, they're, they're no longer uh, present, but the area where their houses were is not part of the current uh, masjid, uh, prof prophet's masjid now. Okay. I don't think there are any questions there. Let's move on. Okay, so let's let's go into the issue now. We're going to go into the issue of fiqh. We're going to talk about the adhan. And what we're going to do is talk, we're going to cover this from one school of thought first in this book. Uh, and then uh, there will be this class and next class, we're going to cover this issue from one school of thought. Then we're going to cover the issue from differences of opinion, right? So we're going to do it two different ways. So that will be the third class, inshallah ta'ala, we're going to go over certain differences. So. The word adhan, what does it mean? What does it mean linguistically? Anyone knows the word adhan? What does it mean linguistically? The, the literal definition. Now what it means in Islam, but the word itself, okay, to call out. That is correct, to announce, to call out, to announce. You know, same thing, right? So yeah, that's basically what it means, right? To call out, to call out or to announce. Now, Islamically, or or as a terminology, Islamic terminology, it means a specific announcement or, or, or a specific call, right? And some people might go into more detail about this specific call, but, you know, we understand that that's the, the specificness of that entails, you know, certain words, facing the qibla, all of these things that you could put in a definition to kind of uh, uh, be more specific. Okay. The first thing the sheikh says here is that the adhan is sunnah. The adhan is sunnah. And he says that this is according to the majority of the scholars. And this is the correct opinion. Notice that it's an opinion, right? But also, this opinion is backed up by ijma', consensus of the scholars, according to uh, this imam. It says, it is also from the sha'air of Islam. It is from one of the rituals of Islam, one of the 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 the, the milestones of Islam to the point where he says that <laughs> so to the point so it is so important the, the adhan is so important and so emphasized and such an integral part of Islam that if a group of people were to say, we are not going to use, you know, I mean, the, the Adhan is only soon. Now, why call it the Imam, the leader of the Muslim, can force them to implement the Adhan. But even though it's Sunnah, it is such a stressed part of Islam that the Imam can force individuals to implement it if they so choose not to. Now, some scholars say that you could even fight them. Like how you can fight the Khawarij, or you can fight the people who decide not to pay zakat, like how um, Abu Bakr did during his uh, caliphate. He fought the people that didn't want to pay the, uh, the, 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 the charity. And he fought them because that was the punishment for that act. Likewise, some scholars say you can fight them. And what we mean by fight, we mean going to war with, right? So you can fight them because they decide or they abstain from calling the adhan. And there is an opinion that it is wajib. There is an opinion that the adhan is obligatory. And the reason why this opinion is there 
is because the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam commanded that the adhan should be called, saying that إِذَا حَضَرَةُ الصَّلَاةِ فَلْيُؤَذِّنْ لَكُمْ أَحَدُكُمْ The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that when the salat comes in, when the salat is in, right, it's time for the prayer, then one of you should call the adhan. That is a hadith, that is muttafaqun alayh, it is in um, Bukhari and Muslim. It is something that is part of the five prayers and Jumu'ah. This is where this sunnah, and what we mean by sunnah, not that it's not obligatory, we're just talking about this action of the Prophet ﷺ is for the five daily prayers and Jumu'ah. So anything other than that does not have an adhan. Anything other than the five daily prayers and Jumu'ah does not have a adhan. And then the the the, uh, the sheikh he goes into like how the the uh, the adhan is performed, you know. Um, I think from that we can uh, just take a little bit here, where he says, for example, that uh, the adhan for fajr you add you add after um ala salah ala falah. Asalatu khairum bin al Twice, right? You say twice. And there is a school of thought, which this imam uh, is part of, that says that the adhan and the aqama are similar, meaning that in the way that they're said, that you know, say them twice. Except that. The only difference is for the adhan, you stop after every uh, sentence while the akama, you meld everything together. Everything is in one, one go. And I think this is as much as we're going to cover Inshallah Ta'ala will complete this aspect of it. Um, next class. Are there any questions on anything we co we covered so far in regards to the uh, then? Oh, it's really raining. Okay, so if there aren't any questions on that aspect of the Adhan, then we're going to move on to, I should have saved my space, subhanAllah. Well, let me see if I can find it back. Okay, I'm gonna have to do that later then. Okay, so we're gonna talk about the issue of nikah, and then there's one issue that we're gonna uh, hopefully address. So here, Bismillah, we're gonna continue talking about that verse, right? The verse we're we're now talking about marriage. Issue of marriage. I remember last class we talked about the the sunnia or the uh, encouragement to get married married in Islam using the verse in which 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, when khiftum an la tuqsitu fil yatama fankihu ma taba lakum min al-nisa, mathna wa thulatha wa ruba. Right? And if you fear that you won't be just to the orphan, then marry who they marry whom you want to or whom you will from among the women. Two, three, and four. So we have a hadith that we're going to cover dealing with that. So um, giving a little bit more explanation to that verse, or at least the beginning part of that verse, right? So it, it says here, قَالْ حَدَّثْنَا إِبْرَاهِيمُ بْنُ مُوسَى قَالْ أَخْبَرَنَا هِشَامْ عَنْ إِبْنِ جُرَيْجِ قَالْ أَخْبَرَنِي هِشَامْ بْنُ عَوْرَةِ عَنْ أَبِيهِ عَنْ عَائِشَةَ رضي الله عنها أنا رجلا كان له يتيمة فنكحها وكان لها عذق وكان يمسكها عليه ولم يكن لها من نفسه شيء فنزل فيه وإن خفتم أن لا تقصتوا في اليتامى أحسبه قال كان شريكته في ذلك عذق وفي ماله Okay, so that this hadith is reported by Urwa on Aisha radiallahu anha and Urwa is the nephew of Aisha she said radiallahu anha that a man had a orphan girl that he was in charge of which he married. This is proof that shows that the wali can marry the individual that he's the wali of. The wali can marry an individual that he is the wali of. Right? <clears throat> because here he's he's the wali of this, this orphan and he married her. And this orphan woman had money basically she had she had um land or most specifically land with dates on it right so he married her and he for specifically for this reason and he really didn't have he didn't really was he was basically he wasn't feeling her like that i mean he didn't really vibe with her on her for anything else other than the fact that she had some money with her and stuff like that, you know, and, and everything. So because of that, he was treating her unjustly. He wasn't, you know, he wasn't giving her her rights. And that's the reason why this verse was revealed um, about, you know, if you don't feel like you can be just concerning the orphans, right, then you should just marry anyone else from among the women right but the thing is that this person specifically married her because she was she was she was um she had money now notice how there was no shaming though in this from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to him about the about his intention anyone notice that so I'm sure that the sisters would have a field day with the brother that married a sister because she was rich oh you could just hear it now what kind of man will do that? <laughs> I guess men been doing that. You know, some men anyway. But of course, this is not this is not something that uh, we should encourage because at the end of the day, you're going to have to take care of that sister anyway, right? So I mean, uh, she, her having money and stuff like that, I mean, it really don't really benefit you if you're if you're doing the right thing. If you're doing the right thing, you're not. It's not going to benefit you, and that's the reason why you know a woman when she says that you know she has money or she works and she believes that this is an asset that a man would look at to, to determine whether or not he's going to marry her. That doesn't really work because none of that money is going to, in most, for, in most instances, in, in a lot of situations, is going to benefit him because a woman would have her money counting it right in front of her husband and he's he don't know why he's gonna how he's gonna pay the light bill tomorrow and not think twice and that and that's just you know 
that's just it. I mean, she's like, you know, well, what are you going to do? We light somebody to close up? Light somebody to shut off and something? We ain't going to have no electricity if you don't find, you know, another job or, you know, sell a kidney, something. And, um, and that's well within her rights. But the reason why I'm bringing this up is that we, as men, we understand that. And that's the reason why we find it very strange that a woman will put as one of her, you know, uh, attributes that are praiseworthy and might be something that, you know, would entice a suitor to, 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 to uh, look her way is the fact that she's wealthy. She's uh, a person of um, high regards. You know, she, she, she likes the finer things in life. When a man, a man interprets a lot of men, not every man, but a lot of men, because most of us, we're, we, we, we have to work for our money. We're not, we're not princes here. So most of us, we're going to look at that and just think about all of the money that we're going to have to spend that we might not have in a scenario like that. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Um, so that's, that's that with that, um, with that specific verse. There's something I wanted to touch on a little bit before we close close up. The issue of marijuana in Islam and using marijuana and um, whether or not it's allowed, is it halal, is it haram, and things like that. Let me preface this by saying that what I am about to say is in no way an Islamic ruling. This is an issue that I have been researching and I continue to research it. And I'm just going to give you guys food for thought. More than anything, this, this is all it is. Islam is about bringing benefit, first, communal benefit, secondly, individual benefit, and removing from a person the bad. But that's, that, that is an Islamic principle. Keep that in mind. I don't know, there's a verse that I, um, for some reason, it's not coming to my mind. I don't want to recite it wrong. Give me a second here. Oh, we're gonna, we're gonna dissect this verse. In order for us to, um, to be able to talk about this issue. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, Yes, alunka and al khamri wal maysir. Qul fihima ithmun, I'm, I'm sorry, fihima ithmun kabirun wa manafi'un lil nas wa ithmuhuma akbaru min nafi'ihima. Allah says they ask you about alcohol and gambling. They ask you about alcohol and gambling. Say, O oh Muhammad, fihima in them is a great sin. And some benefit to the people. In alcohol is a great sin and some benefit to the people. وَإِثْمُهُمَا أَكْبَرُ مِنْ نَفْعِهِمَا But the sin, the bad that is in them is greater than the benefit. Okay? So we understand this. Now, someone would argue and say, there are certain things, or Allah here is talking about khamar, alcohol. 
what does that have to do with other things that aren't alcohol? And some might even argue and say that, well, he's not just talking about alcohol. He's talking about specific alcohol, which is alcohol that's produced by grapes. Called alcohol, the alcohol that is produced by grapes, that is what is called hummer. The alcohol that's produced by honey is not called hummer. I think it's called misru. And the alcohol that's produced by um, by fruits is uh, bitru or, or bizru or something like that. I can't remember. These, these names are <laughs> kind of weird and stuff. Can't remember them all. But every different type of alcohol has a different name, like in English, right? We have wine. We have rum. We have gin. We have scotch. We have uh, beer. All of these things are alcohol. So what do the scholars say? The scholars say that the reason why these things are impermissible are, and fall underneath the umbrella of Hamar is because it's basically the same thing. Different way, different process, different way it's made, but it's basically the same thing as alcohol. And that's the reason why the word for alcohol can loosely, or Hummer can loosely fit into the word of alcohol. Okay. Why is, or why do we as Muslims have the understanding, for the majority of us, we have the understanding that marijuana is impermissible? Why do we have that understanding? Where do we get that from? We get that from the understanding that marijuana is similar to the to alcohol. And we can say that in a lot of instances, it is. Marijuana is similar to alcohol in a lot of instances. Because when we talk about hummer, let's go back to the word hummer. We said that hummer is, talk, is used in the place of the word alcohol. And the word hummer, ha, mim, ra, from that word, we get, also get words that are similar to it. So we can understand what the word hummer means. We get the word himar comes from the word, from the same root, root letters, right? Ka, mim, ra. What is a khimar? Khimar is what women wear. Where do they wear it? What type of, what type of clothing is it, the khimar for a woman? This one should be easy, right? <laughs> the imam is one step ahead of us. So the khimar, the reason why the reason why the khimar is called the khimar is because it covers the head of the woman. The reason why khamar is called khamar is because it covers the intellect of the person. It covers the mind. You lose your reasoning, your rational thought. Weed or marijuana is something that also affects the mind. And because of that, it's been put, from that aspect, it's been put in the, in the same category as alcohol. But what about the medicinal benefits of marijuana? Now, this is where we have to understand, right? Uh, there are medicine that have effect on your mind that are legal and no one questions whether or not a Muslim can take it. There are medicine that say that you cannot operate a vehicle after taking it. Why is that? Because there is some veiling of your mental state, yet no one questions whether or not 
it is permissible for an individual to take. There are side effects to a lot of the, there are medication that were once medication that we know now, now it's not medication, right? Like cocaine was once medication. Now it's not. Why is that? The bad effects of cocaine outweighs the good effects of cocaine. Like Allah said about alcohol. The sin is greater and it has some benefit to people. It has some, some. There is a drug now that was uh, that, that I think the company is being sued. It's a pain uh, drug. I, I can't. I don't remember the name of it, but I'm pretty sure everyone knows what I'm talking about. And there are certain. I think there are some. Uh, the the, the uh, company is being sued because they knew it was addictive. It's a pain medicine. I don't know if it's Ritalin or what it is. Um, and now you have like house moms and stuff like that that are drunkies, druggies. I'm sorry, not drunkies, druggies. Right, because of their addiction to this pill, but all it was was a pain medicine. We, I'm mentioning all of these things so we can kind of just see where think where I'm going with all of this. I guess. When we look at marijuana, it shares certain attributes with alcohol. From an aspect, right? It does change the mind. But the argument can be made that there are other drugs that also change the mind. But what makes those drugs different than alcohol? Why don't we throw those drugs away and say, no, you can't, Oxycontin? Maybe, I have no idea. Why don't we throw those drugs away? The ones that, you know, you can't operate a vehicle or the ones that put you to sleep, knock you out, you know, after taking it, the different side effects that these things have. We don't throw them away. Why is that? Because those things are not the main use of the drugs. Those are considered side effects. Right? You don't use the drug so that you cannot operate a vehicle. You can be so gone out of your mind that you don't know whether you're coming or going. That's not why you use the drug. You use it because it, relieving pain, doing whatever it is that it does and stuff like that, you know, regulate some of your, your bodily functions or whatever. A person who is in extreme pain, who uses marijuana or the the substance that's in marijuana which is what's it, it was htc i think it's called or something like that to help regulate that pain and the side effect that they get from that is that they're a little bit woozy how is that different from any other drug that you know or some other drugs that we have available a person who has a T yeah is that what I said did I say THC or I said something else I can I don't know a person who has um, issues with loss of appetite and they take THC and now they're able to eat instead of losing weight extreme extreme loss instead of having extreme loss of weight and things like that. What can be said about these scenarios? After mentioning those things, I say that marijuana is not permissible for your average Muslim to use.
I repeat, marijuana is not permissible for your average Muslim to use. But my statement there, is that any different than saying any drug that's not prescribed to you is not permissible for you to use? Because of the harm that it can cause you if you're not a person that needs it. If you take a drug that you don't need, it can cause you harm. And from that aspect, those drugs are impermissible for you to use too. But what about the person that needs that drug? For his specific, his or her specific situation, that drug will not harm, but would help. So this is where I have reached in my research and in my assessment of the situation. Like I said, it's not a fatwa for or against. These are just things that I want you to think about like I've been thinking about it. And uh, because this is just me putting certain things for everyone to um, digest and think about, there will be no questions about this issue because I have no answers for you. So I'm gonna, with that, I'm going to end the class by saying, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.